Hello all, it's nice to have you here today. Welcome to our online event. It's an event uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's coming in, in hard times and I think in hard times it's a time when we need action. We're happy to see that uh, so many known faces are around, old friends and collaborators, and of course also new people which we don't know and we are very glad to share with them what we know and to learn from them. We are, I'm Jorgos Constantino, I'm illustrator, I'm educator and uh, an activist for uh, migrant and uh, refugee questions. I am a member of the Irenia uh, Collective, it's, that's a collective we work in Catalonia and uh, it's a collective that believes in, uh, in peace and works with peace games uh, because we believe that uh, the games have a power to change the, the pedagogical uh, paradigm. And uh, we are also here as uh, part of the Anna Lind Foundation, the EMED uh, network, a network which is working all around the Mediterranean. It's, uh, we have uh, representatives of all uh, Mediterranean countries who are offering this uh, big uh, virtual marathon in which our, uh, our today's event is a part of. Uh, actually, for us, Mediterranean, our Mediterranean identity is a very big, very important part of what we are. And uh, it's a big a basic feature for us in this proximity with all of the people around the Mediterranean, around all this beautiful sea, the, the, the three continents which are in the Mediterranean. We all believe that, it's, that what is happening right now is unacceptable. We're living in a time when... Uh, we need to influence our societies and our politicians to change what is happening now. We have to stop the killing in the Mediterranean. Pushbacks, drowned children and families, barbed wire, 10 meter walls, fences, police violence, criminal actions on the borders, unprotected children. All this is not the sea we love. It's not the Mediterranean we love. And this is why today we invite you to take part in our workshop, to see what we have done as one of the examples of how we can act against all that. And uh, I hope you will enjoy it. And uh, I think the first thing to do is just to see all together our film, The Middle Sea. Some people will see it with English subtitles. Some others will see it with Arabic subtitles. And I'm really looking forward to see your comments and your uh, questions in the chat so that we can answer them after the short video. So let the video start. La Mediterránea forma parte de la nuestra identidad. Desde las montañas de los Pirineos, el río Llobregat porta agua fins a la ciudad de Barcelona y desemboca al mar Mediterráneo. Estem conectados amb la Mediterránea por la geografía. El nuestro mar tiene tres forats que separan los tres continentes que l'envolten. envolven. Primer, el Estret de Gibraltar, que comunica el Océano Atlántico con el Mediterráneo. Son 14 kilómetros los que separan África y Europa, los regnes de España y Marroc. El segundo forat es el Canal de Suez, que comunica la Mediterránea con el Mar Roig y el Océano Indi. Permet allargar el mar roig que separa África y Asia, pasando entre mig de Egipto y la península arábica para arribar fins a conectarse amb la Mediterránea. El tercer forat es el estret de Bósfor, entre mig de Europa y Asia, que conecta el mar Mediterráneo a el mar Negra, pasando por el costat de la antigua ciudad de Troya y la actual Istanbul. Y a cuatro grandes penínsulas, la ibérica, la de los Apenins, o italiana que sembla una bota, la balcánica, amb Grècia al sud, que sembla una mà extesa, i la península de l'Àsia Menor, la de Turquia. A la Mediterrània hi ha les illes grans de Sicília, Sardenya, Còrsega, Creta, Mallorca, Gerba. Hi ha les dues illes que són estats, Xipre, que sembla una mà, que fa pasigogues a l'exella d'Àsia, i Malta, a mig camí entre Itàlia i Líbia. Les dues mil illes gregues, les mil illes croates i les illes balears. El riu més gran de la Mediterrània no és el Llobregat, és el Nil, que forma un gran delta a la seva desembocadura, una zona habitada per 30 milions de persones, 
Aquí va néixer la civilització egípcia, que encara ens impressiona amb les seves grans piràmides, algunes construïdes des de fa 30 segles. L'egípcia va ser una civilització que va ensenyar a la gent mediterrània a fer càlculs de geometria i matemàtiques, com cultivar, regar i repartir les terres fèrtils, i com escriure amb imatges. Una mica més amunt va néixer una altra gran civilització, la Fenícia. Els fenicis van idear el primer alfabet on a cada so se li assignava un símbol. Van ser grans mariners que navegaven ja mil anys abans de Crist per comerciar amb tots els pobles que habitaven les costes mediterrànies. Van crear colònies a Egipte, a Líbia, a Tunísia, a la península ibèrica, a Còrsega i Sicília. La ciutat fenícia de Cartago esdevé un centre de la seva cultura i tothom va prendre d'ells. Els pobles mediterranis estem connectats per la història. Un dels pobles que van aprendre molt dels fenicis van ser els grecs, que van transformar l'alfabet fenici. Li van donar mitja volta a l'àlif per convertir-lo en alfa. I també van ser viatgers i comerciants, i van fundar colònies com ara Marsella, Empúries o Siracusa. Van ensenyar el seu art i van tenir una gran influència sobre els seus veïns. Invents grecs, com ara la filosofia, el teatre i la democràcia, Paraules com la geometria o la política han arribat arreu i encara segueixen per aquí. Els pobles de la Mediterrània estem connectats per la cultura. El lloc on es va conservar millor la ciència i la literatura grega va ser Alexandria, amb una immensa biblioteca, creada fa 2.000 anys. Un cop que la civilització grega es va començar apagant, el poble que es va fer fort a la Mediterrània van ser els romans. A Roma, les lletres fenícies van tornar a transformar-se. Del delta grec es va fer la de llatina. Van ocupar el Mediterrani de bat a bat i van portar la seva llengua i la seva cultura fins a l'últim racó del Mare Nostrum. Un record de la seva conquesta del Mediterrani és el fet que encara avui en dia a Itàlia, França, Espanya i Romania parlem llengües que provenen del llatí. Els pobles del Mediterrani estem connectats per les paraules. L'ocupació romana de Palestina va provocar l'exili del poble jueu, un poble monoteista, que negava la condició de Déu que els romans atribuïen al seu emperador. Va ser l'època que les ensenyances d'un jove jueu, Jesús de Betlem, van escampar-se tot arreu, agafant fort a llocs amb presència de la diàspora jueva. A les ciutats de Tessalònica, Barcelona, Alger o Roma, la religió cristiana va començar a convertir-se en una religió molt popular. I en l'època que uns pobles del nord conquistaven Roma i tot l'oest mediterrani, la religió cristiana, nascuda a Àsia, es va convertir en la religió oficial de Constantinoble, capital d'un nou imperi que s'extenia des de Palestina fins a Algèria. Els pobles de la Mediterrània estem connectats per les religions. Un segle més tard, neix una nova religió, l'Islam, fundada per Muhammad, per un jove àrab comerciant de la ciutat de Meca, a la península aràbica. La religió de l'Alcorà es converteix en la nova religió majoritària de tot Àsia Menor, el nord d'Àfrica i la península ibèrica. Gràcies a l'expansió de la cultura islàmica, el coneixement acumulat a la Biblioteca d'Alexandria es va difondre per tot el Mediterrani, enriquit per costums, músiques i poesies en llengua àrab. En aquesta època, tothom va deixar d'utilitzar la manera d'escriure els números, com feien els grecs o els romans, substituint-la amb la manera àrab. Durant els segles d'or d'aquesta civilització, els àrabs van ensenyar medicina, astronomia, matemàtiques, van aportar normes d'higiene, noves maneres de regar i de construir. Tenim un gran legat d'aquest passat a la península ibèrica, els regnes de l'Àndalus. Un legat de topònims, arquitectura, paraules i música. Les tres religions monoteistes, el judaïsme, el cristianisme i l'islam, van conviure durant vuit sigles, fins que els reis catòlics van conquerir la península. Llavors van obligar a tothom a convertir-se al cristianisme o a ser expulsats. Centenars de milers de musulmans i jueus van ser reprimits i expulsats i molts van trobar refugi al nord d'Àfrica, l'est del Mediterrani o la península dels Apenins. Els últims 150 anys van ser marcats pel domini del colonialisme europeu. Des de la caiguda de l'imperi otomà, 
tot el nord d'Àfrica i l'Orient Mitjà es van convertir en països governats per potències estrangeres. Les ferides d'aquesta època encara són vives. L'alliberament dels països ha sigut un procés difícil i el domini del nord sobre el sud encara no s'ha superat. Durant tota la història de la Mediterrània, els pobles s'han mogut, s'han parejat. Fenicis, grecs, romans, àrabs, genovesos, venecians, catalans han anat a viure a diferents països portant els seus costums, les seves músiques, històries, religions, idees, les seves maneres de cuinar i de fer festa. Els pobles de la Mediterrània estem connectats perquè compartim el clima mediterrani, el que fa que les mateixes plantes puguin créixer als voltants del nostre mar. A tot arreu trobarem olives, blat i raïm. Estem connectats amb la mateixa cuina, la cuina mediterrània, que és una suma de tot el que vam copiar un de l'altre durant tots aquests segles. Des de la paella i la pizza, la pasta, el falàfel, el dònor o el hummus, compartim molt més que un mar. Compartim històries, contes, costums, compartim una manera de ser. Tenim noms nascuts a Palestina, Israel, a Grècia o a Roma. Durant tota la nostra història, el Mediterrani va ser la cruïlla de civilitzacions, el camí per comunicar-se, una via d'intercanvi i d'aprenentatge. Però ara això s'està canviant. El Mediterrani està esdevenint frontera. Una frontera que separa els pobles. Una frontera cruel que no deixa passar el que sempre passava. Des de l'any 2000, més de 35.000 persones van morir al Mediterrani intentant arribar a les costes europees. Fugint de guerres, de pobresa, de la falta de llibertat, la gent aquesta troba les fronteres tancades. Gent que arriba a les costes europees portant les seves músiques, les seves històries, les seves idees, els seus somnis i esperances i estan morint cada dia a les portes d'Europa. Els nostres governs del nord estan convertint el mar en un mur. Els rius dels nostres països de la riba nord contaminen el mar. Les nostres empreses s'estan enriquint amb les vendes de maquinari i armament i la mà d'obra barata del sud. Els pobles del Mediterrani estan connectats per l'economia i les migracions i alhora estem vetant l'entrada a les persones dels països del sud i de l'est. Estem negant la història que ens uneix. Estem convertint el mar en una gran fossa comuna. So thank you very much for watching. I think some of you maybe had the version without subtitles, so you didn't see, you just heard the voice in Catalan. But uh, I think that for even for people who don't understand the language, the pictures are pretty obvious. This marvelous music by Yanis Papayoano, which is this music that accompanies or uh, that is the soundtrack of our movie, I think also gives a sense of what we are talking about. But definitely, please check uh, for the place uh, where uh, I'm going to post it right now, where you can see the link to the page where you can find the different versions of subtitled of this movie subtitled. You can find it in, uh, in uh, Arabic, in uh, Greek, in English, in Italian and in German language. And we are still working with uh, different friends and people from around the Mediterranean to produce more subtitled versions. I would like to remind you all that uh, you are really invited to send in your questions. Thank you very much for the first questions, which are already arriving. And uh, 
I think that the the best time to talk about all that will be just uh, in the second part of our event, where we are going to meet all together for having uh, Mediterranean coffee. For the moment, I just uh, invite you to see a small video explaining how and uh, what brought us to make this film. So welcome to see this short video and uh, we'll be back again in some minutes. Our Middle Sea video has a special story. It starts uh, some five years ago, while uh, during the time of this uh, big migrant wave, which brought over one million people from due, through the Greek islands. At that time, our, our collective, Irenia, who has been doing so many workshops uh, at schools, we've been always doing uh, non-competitive games at school, we've been asked to produce and to offer to, the, to these public schools workshops considering the situation for explaining what's happening to their uh, students. For us it was a pretty difficult decision because on the one hand we knew that we could never offer as much as they wanted and on the other hand it was kind of immoral to try to, to, to offer uh, our professional work for, uh, on this uh, situation which was actually a humanitarian crisis. So we contacted with uh, Stop Mare Mortum, which is a Catalan organization working on this subject, and we organized a series of workshops with people who were uh, working in education, activists, teachers, and, uh, and people who were just interested in the subject, and we organized a series of, uh, of workshops during which we created uh, some new educational materials for to being brought to schools and being taught and being facilitated through those activists from this organization. And uh, so we started, we made these uh, workshops and actually we created uh, four different games. It was a very interesting experience and uh, actually we managed to socialize a lot of our knowledge but uh, there was a problem like uh, I always do at schools when I go and make workshops considering the Mediterranean Sea. What I do was, is always to begin the, my classes by making a big uh, drawing on the blackboard or whiteboard explaining what is the Mediterranean because kids don't know so much or they have partial knowledge or they have a knowledge which is some kind of filtered of uh, the national view of the Mediterranean. Actually, you can socialize a lot, but it was pretty difficult for the people to, for the people who participated in the workshop to learn the way I was doing this on the blackboard. So the solution was to create a film. The solution was to make a film out of all this explanation, try to put it all in one short video, which could be then projected in the classes as a introduction to the subject. Back then, in Berlin, I contacted with Doro, Dorothea Vogel, who is a professional animator and who is a filmmaker and has a nice studio in Berlin. And uh, we worked on it a couple of days and it was really... and we were really pleased by the result. We asked Yanis Papayoano, a great uh, musician, Greek musician living in Barcelona, to make us... Uh, to, to create for us the soundtrack. And uh, actually the result uh, is what you see, what you saw just before. Uh, the script was made especially for this film, but it was based on all this experience of 10 years of workshops with children, where actually uh, when you do workshops with children, you have to really get to the point in a way that you don't use either those big words and this wording of uh, social, uh, you know, big words. So we decided to, like, the, the script was really based on this knowledge with uh, easy to understand uh, descriptions of what is the story, what is the reality. And uh, I think that uh, actually we managed to make a film that addresses all audiences. You can, it's for children, young children from 10 years old and beyond and actually for everybody. Since the creation of the film, the video has been seen by many, many people at many, many schools. 
It has been seen in, uh, it has been projected in a human rights festival. It has had its own special audience also through the Maidan network, which offered uh, five, I think it's five or is it six, subtitled versions. Thanks to the help of many people who offered their work uh, for free, and actually it was all done practically for free. We had the support of uh, Stop Mare Mortum, the support of Irania, but actually the main work was done uh, as, a, as, an, you know, as a volunteer, as an activist offer to society. As we put this context in the time perspective, I think it's pretty easy to realize how absurd the current European border policies are, which are actually denying a long history of uh, intercultural exchange, a long history of Medi the Mediterranean being the crossroads of civilizations, this crossroad where, where uh, people from either sides of the, either banks of the, of this uh, middle sea, influenced each other, learned from each other, where knowledge from one place is transferred to the other and uh, gets a new form. It's actually pretty obvious that uh, our common history is based in this interaction of civilizations and what the current policies of Europe are provoking is to transform this uh, sea which is actually has always been a bridge transforming it into a wall a very brutal wall where the last years since 2000 we have over we have counted over 38,000 deaths and it's uh, actually this which, uh, like this, putting this historical perspective allows us to get a step beyond and understand that uh, the current situation is uh, absolutely new, is absolutely illogical, and it's a situation that has no future because there's no, no wall tall enough, there is no fence strong enough to keep back people who are escaping from misery, from hunger, from war. Every year, hundreds of thousands of tourists go to the Mediterranean. They come from all, the, all around Europe, the Northern Europe, Western Europe, from all around the world. They come to enjoy this marvelous place with this marvelous sea. And actually, it is pretty sad to see that all those people try to look away what's happening today. What's happening is that this Mediterranean Sea is converted into a huge mass grave. We all know about the Mediterranean, but our view is uh, pretty much conditioned of our national history. Everybody looks the Mediterranean under behind his national glasses. And what we wanted to say is that uh, we should uh, just uh, realize that there is a common history which is shared by all and which is our common shared past. So instead of taking just one view, we try to show all those things which uh, have influenced us, which has influenced all those civilizations, all those countries around the Mediterranean, in a sense, we wanted to also show what this colonial past means, what this Eurocentric vision of the Mediterranean means. And uh, we put the focus also on all those things which happened outside of Europe, on the other side. Talking about the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, talking about the past of this uh, huge, big uh, Arabic Golden Age, this COVID, Corona-19 year, reminded us that it's how important it is to have this kind of materials. Because it's the materials which can be really used also for remote learning. And it's so important to understand that uh, we need to explain this view. We need to remind everybody that uh, normality is what has happened forever. What is abnormal is what's happening now.
<laughs> Sorry. So this is an explanation about uh, what brought us to make this film, which are the which were the the conditions under which we created it. I think it's uh, it's an enriching view about what was and why we made it, and uh, I think that it's. Uh, also pretty important to understand, to know what is uh, the way to create it in, a in the technical terms. So our uh, animator and uh, great filmmaker, Dorothea Vogel, she also prepared a small tutorial about how you do a film like that. Please don't forget to keep on writing your questions. Thank you very much and enjoy Dorothea's little film. Hi, I'm Doro Vogel. I am a graphic designer with a little over 20 years of experience in the field of animation. And in this video, I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the production of the animated film, The Middle Sea. I will speak a little about the script and the storyboard, then the voice recording, the video shooting, about composing and editing. Jogos told me about his idea to make an educational animation about the history of the whole Mediterranean area, which in recent years has become the sad stage for the dramatic disruption between the southern and the northern countries. When Jogos and I first met, he described his idea to make a continuous drawing on a whiteboard with color markers and tell the story in the course of the drawing. I liked his idea very much. Jogos had a very clear idea of how the images would look like and how the story should be told on the development of the drawings. Now my part in this film was to make it technically possible and to put everything together in the end. The first thing we needed to solve was how we would take the video of the drawing to see it grow and to see his hand drawing. In the studio we could fix a camera above the whiteboard. Then we adjusted light sources on both sides of the stage. We had to put them in a very low position to have even light on the entire scene and at the same time avoid too much reflection on the glossy whiteboard. We also covered the lights with transparent paper to have softer shadows under the hand. The setup of lights and camera should be as good as possible before you start with the shooting. Spend a lot of time with the set. Anything that has to be corrected in the post-production is a lot of work. Now, the technical setup was solved. Then I asked Yorgos, the mother of all questions, what do you want to say? Yorgos, who is a really great improviser, answered, well, I will talk about this and that and then that and then that, so on. And I said, okay, write it down. We need a script. A script is the starting point for any film or piece of animation. So Yorgos wrote the script and then in the next step we put the script and the visual ideas together. The easiest way to do that is in a table format. This is a storyboard. The storyboard can also be illustrated with simple drawings. Many times the visual idea comes first when you plan an animation. To produce the images is usually a lot of work and it's often difficult to repeat. Don't start with the images. Take good care of the script and the storyboard. This can save you a lot of work in the end. With the storyboard in place, we were not yet ready for the image shooting. We began with a voice recording. It is always a good idea to begin with a recording of the spoken text because it marks the timing. In animation, everything is about timing. You can adjust a picture in time, but you cannot adjust the voice in time. The voice. Yogos recorded the voice with a little voice recorder, but many times the smartphone does a good job. Now we have the sound files. With that, we had a re reliable idea of the entire length of the movie and of each scene. With the voice recording ready, we could start with the shooting of the images. First, we had been thinking about the possibility to do everything in stop motion technique. That means in sequences of many single photos. But then we wouldn't have a continuous movement of the hand, so we decided to record video sequences. With the storyboard, we had a good guidance for what should appear in the drawing in each scene. Of course, the action of the drawing took much longer than the spoken text, so the video had to be accelerated a lot in the composition. 
We recorded all the scenes in one single day, a very, very long day. In the end, we had over 40 video scenes. In addition to the video recording, Yorgos made the drawings for the title sequence and for the credits. Now we had all the visual material and the sound we would need for the composition. Usually, the recorded material, sound and images need some improvement. Next comes the compositing. All the video and sound files are composed together with Adobe Premiere. Here you can see the interface of Premiere with the project files, the source monitor and the preview monitor. Everything happens here in the timeline. This is where all the bits and pieces are put together. This is also where the speeding of the video sequences happen. In the composition, all the visual elements are adjusted to the timing of the voice. Then the title is added to the beginning and the credits to the end of the sequence. Now the composition is ready for rendering. The entire movie is exported to the desired video format. I hope this video gave you an idea about the production process of the movie The Middle Sea. Thank you for your attention. A marvelous work by Doro. It's, um, it's uh, really a huge difference when you work with people who know the work and who are professionals in what they do. But I think the most important thing after all is always that uh, you put uh, your heart in it. Like uh, when uh, you believe when you, what, in what you do, then definitely the result becomes much better. I have a, the, the first question, which have, when one of the first questions which just came in is a question which I will just answer, answer in a short, uh, with a short answer. And uh, I would like to remind you that all your questions could be discussed later when we all go over to the Zoom meeting where we can have a coffee together and where all those questions can be discussed among all the people who came to our today's event. So the question was about the different reactions of people around the Mediterranean. Was there any negative reactions by people? Because when you want to address so many countries and so many cultures, there's always a risk that you miss something. And there I must uh, say that uh, when you do a 10 minutes film, it's impossible to say everything. It's a decision you have to take from the beginning that some parts of the story will stay untold. Like, for example, we have almost no explanation about uh, the Ottoman Empire. We have uh, nothing about uh, the Amazigh people who live in the northern uh, areas of uh, Maghreb, of the northwest Africa. There's many things which are missing, but uh, I think what uh, is more important is to, to try to, to, to make a general view and to create this um, this vision which goes beyond borders. And we definitely had also some negative uh, reactions, but I think that it was rather the positive which, uh, which came over in, in many different ways. And uh, there was this little question, for example, around there on this, uh, on this side, you know, just here in this place of the Mediterranean where it is so difficult to just give an answer with uh, one word, what happens between Israel and Palestine. We decided to just leave it in a sense that everybody understands that there is something missing. And by leaving it untold, maybe it's also an answer. It's also a way to, to explain what's happening. So this is uh, more than less a first answer. I have more answers, but as I really would like to have uh, your counter answers to what I say, I would really prefer to not spend so much time on the answers now and uh, keep on to explain something which is uh, the second part of our today's event. It's the part where we want to explain how to use this educational material, this video, to create activities at schools, to create activities with groups of people. And uh, herefore, I wanted to invite you to see the video of Sergei. Uh, 
before I show that, I maybe I need to say something which is also came came in as a question, and I think it's interesting to say the answer. What is what do we want with what we mean about migration? What do we expect from the people who are migrating? Actually, for us, migration is a part, a constant part of our history. And what we want is to create societies where inclusion is written with big letters instead of all this talk about integration, instead of all this what's happening with the segregation of uh, foreigners. What inclusion means is that we really take in, as a, we acknowledge what those people who come from, the, from other countries bring to our own countries. All our societies have to realize that uh, diversity is an added value. One second thing which I wanted to say about that is we should never forget when we want to communicate things to children, to schools, to people, we should uh, never forget that it must, it must be, in a way, fun. Like uh, what we do with Irenia is we always try to do non-competitive games because competitivity is not what helps us become more solidarious person. And we want to try to have societies where individualism has its little, it is there, but what we really need is societies that think of all of us together. So uh, I welcome you to see the video by Sergei. It's a short video. And I would like you to ask questions or uh, to, just, uh, to just explain if you didn't understand something or uh, if you want some extra explanation by Sergei, he himself will be on the Zoom meeting and he could answer all your questions. Enjoy. Let's learn more about the Mediterranean through drawing a huge Mediterranean map. You can actually draw a huge Mediterranean map on any surface. To decide where you paint your huge Mediterranean map, you have to think of if you do it indoors or outdoors. You can do it outdoors, on the floor, on a street, in the schoolyard, but you can also do it inside and then it's better maybe to do it on a fabric, unless you do it on a wall. For our video, Sergei just took 24 A3 papers, which was the maximum of size which was fitting under his camera. The next step is to measure exactly the surface where you want to paint the big map. The next step is to print out a map in the size of a DIN 4 paper. The size of our papers, like the how long it is and how tall it is, has to be transferred onto our map, onto A4 photocopy. So we draw a grid over our map. Once the map is ready with the grid on, you photocopy it once more, and the second photocopy you cut into three pieces. One for every group which is going to start drawing. Having this piece of paper in your hand, you can easily copy the form of the map from the small paper, copy it into the big surface. Sergey has a lot of experience in doing this kind of maps in public spaces, in squares, on roads, or big pieces of cloth. And this is a standard technique which you can use. And it doesn't depend on which materials you'll use in the end, because you can do it with a marker, like Sergei does, and just some blue paint. Or you can do it with many more colors, choosing six different colors with which you also draw the, each country by itself. Or you can just draw it by chalk, on the street. While drawing on a map, people get more used to the forms, they try to reproduce, they understand details. It's a way already to get into this feeling of what the Mediterranean looks like. And it creates a marvelous feeling of group when three groups independent from each other start doing something which ends up being such a beautiful big picture that everybody's proud of.
Yes, thank you, Sergei, for your great reproduction of what we wanted to explain. And actually, you saw the, the pictures. It's, uh, it's an activity we've done in different places uh, throughout those last years. And uh, it is very useful to say, like, uh, our work as activists or as an uh, organization which work with, uh, in schools or uh, who work with migrants, it is so important to have the support of uh, local society and the local authorities. We had the support of, uh, of the city of Molins de Rey for making this one with chalk. We had the support of uh, the Casa Arabe, the, the Arabic house in Madrid, to make a similar workshop in Madrid. And uh, the picture, the huge five by five map you saw was made during the Annalyn Foundation meeting in Tarragona and uh, some years ago. And those are just some examples. And this is just, uh, I think it's important to see that it's possible to do it. It seems so difficult when you start, but in the end, by the work of so many people, the map becomes really well recognizable. And then you can start a whole, mm, a whole process where people, and mainly those people who have who come from those countries or who are migrants or her parents are migrants or who have been tourists in those countries, they start to add the names of the countries, the names of the places, the names of the countries in the country's own name, which is sometimes so different than what we know in English. And uh, so this big map becomes uh, a compendium for all this collective knowledge and becomes also the playground for a game, which is something I'm going to explain with our next little video. Our Peace, game, Peace Games uh, collective, uh, Irenia, has been uh, offering this, uh, a lot of workshops in schools. One of them was uh, Entreteras between the countries. This Entreteras is actually uh, a pretty interesting way to have children learning through game, through playing, you know. What uh, the way that questions are made are, uh, is helping that uh, not only the people who know can answer, but uh, also people who can think and could, who can understand the context. What Sergei explained us, this uh, once you know, once you make this huge Mediterranean map on the floor, once you have the Mediterranean drawn so that you can step on it and you can see it as a big, big area, helps you realize uh, the distances in a different way. Once the children have been drawing on it, they can also they have also realized lots of things which are details of this Mediterranean geography. So the second part of, of this is to start playing those games which we had uh, been doing with Entreteras and imagining new games which can be done over this huge surface. Making questions and answers, making questions which can be answered by children, not only with words but also with action. For example, try to make a jump from Algeria to uh, Greece. Does it take one step? Does it take two, step, two steps? The distance between the far eastern and the far western part of the Mediterranean. Just jumping over this and walking over it and making these steps, it really creates a new connection to this geographical region. It creates a more corporal relation to it. You can ask uh, things which are, uh, can be shown on the map, like for example, which is the three countries which are uh, at those big Mediterranean holes, Egypt, uh, Spain and Turkey. Which are the countries which are uh, on the northern side of the Mediterranean, which are the countries which are on the south, uh, which are the countries which, uh, which is the biggest country, which are the three biggest countries and the smallest countries on the Mediterranean. 
could you name the two states which are uh, uh, the two islands which are a state another thing you can make having such a big map where you can step on is uh, to name one person uh, to stay on each country so 23 people are standing each one on one country each one has the name of can can repeat the name of the country so it's very easy to listen to all the names just uh, making this round around the mediterranean each one can just answer a question for example which countries of the mediterranean are speaking arabic the ones who speak arabic please stand up the ones who don't speak it uh, sit down which countries are mainly Islamic, have, uh, have a majority of Islamic population. Is it the same? Uh, the same ones, the Arabic countries and the Muslim countries? Or is it uh, there is a couple of countries more which are not Arabic but are, have a, a Muslim tradition? Or which countries do speak Latin languages? Which countries... So stand up, sit down, check this, check that, and this be be becomes a game where actually there's so many things you can ask and you can explain whether it is tell us three countries which start with the letter A or tell us three countries which are named in a completely different way in their own language and in English you can share knowledge you can uh, play with knowledge and you can also invite the people to explain their own experiences which countries have you been in just make a just step on the countries you have already been and also you can just make questions which uh, reveal how stereotyped our views are from the mediterranean for example asking the children which country of the mediterranean in which country of the mediterranean the people never go to the beach they start thinking and actually it's none but they say it might be this it might be Morocco it might be Palestine it might be whichever but once you know that the Mediterranean is so appealing and once you have maybe some migrant children in the class or children whose parents are have been migrants the answers become very obvious this gives us a context where you can explain about Mediterranean climate, about the, the plants that grow. Which Mediterranean country doesn't have olive trees? All of them do. You can talk about religions, you can talk about uh, languages, you can talk about the food, no? You can talk about pizza, which is pizza in Italy and it's pita in Greek and it's coca in Catalonia and it's all those different ways where uh, those uh, those same ingredients are served and they're so similar and each one thinks that they are part of their own national tradition but they are part of a much bigger tradition a common tradition and they are conditioned by the fact that we are all so similar because all those civilizations is the common history of all of us so playing over the Mediterranean is really becomes a really nice game, an endless game actually, where uh, children and adults share their knowledge, where uh, we can talk about uh, the names of, the, of everybody. You know, so many people who have an Arabic name, uh, a Jewish, a Hebraic name or a Greek or an Italian, and those names can be found in countries which are other ones, you know, like uh, there is Maria, not only in this area of uh, Judeo-Arabic uh, origin, it's used all over the Mediterranean. And the name of David, the name of Alex, all those names which have, which we actually don't really ask ourselves where they come from because they're so used to that. And this is actually what we propose. Play this game and realize yourselves how many things we know but we don't say, how many things don't fit 
into our national narratives and uh, actually could help us understand the world we live in. So I hope uh, it wasn't too long. I hope you had some good time listening to all these introductions and all these explanations. And uh, it's definitely not an easy task to speak about something which is so obvious about this Mediterranean identity that we feel is so obvious for us. And uh, sometimes uh, it seems that people want to forget or don't focus on that. So I think that knowledge is a very basic feature for understanding that we all share all what we share. And it's uh, almost also very important for, uh, for us and uh, for everybody to understand that uh, some things we say may be offending for another. And by playing a game, you can really understand things that you say or that you think or that you believe, which are, uh, based, which are based on stereotypes, which are based on uh, lack of knowledge or uh, uh, distorted knowledge. So I would like to invite you now to have uh, a step together into the Zoom meeting. Because uh, your questions are there, and I think that the best of all would be to talk about them all together. In uh, just uh, five minutes, we put some music on, and uh, I would like all of you to come over to this more uh, sociable uh, surrounding to this environment of Zoom, where uh, we could exchange experiences, we could see our faces. Please turn on your cameras, it could be nice to see each other. And uh, I hope uh, you will be with us and uh, you will enjoy our uh, next, uh, the, the last part of our today's event. So I leave you with this. I, I would definitely want to thank all those people who helped us for making this today. I would like to thank, uh, of course, uh, Dorothea and Sergi, who are the people who helped us in uh, explaining those videos, these explanation videos. I would definitely also like to thank our uh, uh, translators, Fatima and Ahmed from, uh, from Palestine, uh, my local friend who's helping me here, reading your uh, questions in Arabic. I would like to thank you very much to say a big thank you to Pandelis, who's the guy who make us, gave us all this technical support for doing it. And uh, also to Kostas Papadopoulos, who cut the videos, who made the editing. I'd love to thank Josep Miquel, who many of you know, he's the coordinator of Irenia and who really <laughs> sacrificed lots of his time that this event may happen. So thank you all, and uh, thank you for all for being here. Thank you all the people, which I didn't mention because, yeah, uh, I don't think I could thank enough. There's so many people who are helping us doing things. It's never possible to change the world if you don't work together with people. And if you're not uh, uh, wanting to also see that you are never the person who knows everything. There's so many people who can put together their knowledge and their capacities to make uh, things happen. So see you at the Zoom meeting. Let's have a coffee together. We have now five, 10 minutes with the music on that everybody can prepare his kind of coffee and uh, see you there. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.